Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. So today's talk is going to be on one of my favorite subjects, which is Feynman diagrams. And since there's quite a lot to be said, uh, there will be at least two parts, maybe more. So many of you, I'm sure, know who Richard Feynman was. So he was probably one of the most famous physicists and for a good reason. So he obtained the Physics Nobel Prize in 1964 together with uh, Schwinger and Tomonoga for developing quantum electrodynamics. He's also known for his lectures on physics, which have been published in book form, but you also find the recordings on YouTube. And uh, other items he's known about is there are collections of anecdotes on his life, like the book uh, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, and he was also part of the uh, committee that investigated the Challenger disaster, known as the Rogers Commission. But today we are going to be interested in some of his contributions to quantum mechanics. So the two rela related tools he introduced are path integrals and Feynman diagrams. So here you have uh, an example of a Feynman diagram that you find on Wikipedia. And when you first look at, at this, uh, people sometimes tell you that you see time is going here from left to right, and you have uh, an electron and a positron colliding, and they transform into a photon, and then the photon uh, splits into uh, two quarks, and uh, one of them emits a gluon. So this is actually uh, not quite what happens in uh, quantum field theory. What is more the case is that actually you have, uh, you want to describe an experiment, maybe in a particle accelerator, where a number of particles uh, enter the, the accelerator at the beginning and then they collide and a certain number of things happen. And you want to know, after a given time, what is the probability to find various particles at various places. And quantum field theory, in principle, allows you to, uh, to have a formula that allows you to compute that, but it is, uh, in general, a very complicated expression. It's, in effect, an infinite dimensional integral. So, only in very exceptional cases can you compute the, the outcome. However, in quantum electrodynamics, there is uh, something helpful, which is that typically the interactions between particles are quite small. They are governed by a small parameter related to the fine structure constant. And th for that reason, you can attempt to do something perturbative, so like a Taylor expansion. And Feynman diagrams are a graphical way of representing the terms you get when you make this expansion. And then afterward you can interpret the different diagrams you have in this expansion as particles interacting, colliding, uh, splitting, and so on. Now, uh, when I was a, a student, I was of course fascinated by these uh, these things, but the closest I came to quantum field theory was a lecture on quantum electrodynamics, which was very interesting, but we didn't go all the way to Feynman diagrams. And then I, you could say I got sidetracked, I got interested in other things like uh, dynamics of billiards and dynamical systems and uh, stochastic differential equations. and. For a long time I believed that it is not possible to really understand what a Feynman diagram is unless you understand quantum electrodynamics. However, a few years ago these uh, diagrams started appearing in fields I was working on, stochastic partial differential equations, and I realized that actually it is possible to uh, understand in a way what these diagrams are without having to enter all the details of quantum field theory. 
So today I'm going to present some quite simple examples and in a later lecture I will go more toward actually Feynman diagrams. So let us start with some simple warm-up uh, exercises. So here I have written a sequence of inverses of powers of 2. And let me ask the question of what is the sum of all these numbers? And you probably know the answer. Here is a graphical proof of that. So here I've drawn a few squares and triangles and let's say that the side length of the squares is equal to 1. So the left square here has an area of 1. Now in the right square the triangle, which is half the square, has an area of one half. And then I divide the remaining triangle into two halves, so one half has an area of a quarter, and then I get an area of one over eight, one over sixteen, and so on. And you see that by doing this I get indeed all the uh, inverses of powers of two. And I can fit everything into uh, the large rectangle, which has dimensions 1 and 2, so the area is equal to 2. So the, the answer is that this infinite sum, what we call a series in mathematics, is actually equal to 2. So one has to be a bit precise on what one means by that in mathematics. So we, see, we say that the uh, series, the infinite sum, converges to 2. And here what you can actually say is a bit more precise. If we stop at a certain level, so for instance 1 over 32, you see that the, the remaining triangle has also an area of 1 over 32. So actually if I sum all these powers up to 1 over 2 to the n, this will be equal to 2 minus 1 over 2 to the n. And as n goes to infinity, 1 over 2 to the n goes to 0, and so my infinite sum will be equal to 2. Now, there are a few other examples of graphical constructions like that, that allow you to compute sums of powers of some number. So, here's another example from uh, the website you, you see here. And I invite you to pause the video if you're not watching live and uh, thinking a little bit on what uh, these pictures are telling us. So the point here is that let's say that the large triangle has an area of 1 and in the left half I've split it into four triangles and they all have the same area. So they all have the area of a quarter. And in the right half what I've done is that uh, the white triangle again has been split into four triangles and one of them into four triangles and so on. So if I now look at uh, the red triangles, I get here uh, areas of one quarter for the largest one. The next one has a side length which is half as large, so the area is a quarter of that of the first triangle, so 1 over 16, and so on. So if I add the areas of all red triangles, I get this sum, a quarter plus 1 over 16 plus 1 over 64. But the same is of course true for the blue and green triangles. So, and therefore I can say that since the total area of the red and the green and the blue triangles is equal to 1. Each of these uh, colors has an area of 1 over 3. And here's yet another example that allows you to compute sums of powers of 1 third. So I let you figure out by yourself why this allows me to compute so the sum one third plus the square of one third plus the third power of one third plus so and so on. And to conclude that this is equal to one half. 
All right, so now let us look at the problem in a slightly different way. So let's assume I want to solve this equation 0 0.9 times x equals 1. Of course, we know that the answer is given by x is 1 over 0 0.9. Now if I compute what this is, I get this answer 1.1111 repeated uh, infinitely often. Now of course, uh, this is not so surprising because 0 0.9, that is 9 over 10, so its inverse is 10 over 9, and we know that decimal expansions of fractions are either finite or they, uh, after a while, start repeating uh, indefinitely. But there's uh, actually more to, to this. So let's look at 0 0.99 times x equals 1. In that case, I get, of course, the x is equal to the inverse of 0 0.99. And that is now given by 1.010101. So let us look at, more generally, the equation 1 minus a times x equals 1, where a is some real number different from 1. So then x is equal to the inverse of 1 minus a. However, I can do something else. I can rewrite my equation in the following way. So I can put x here on, on the left and 1 plus ax on the right. Now, of course, this doesn't solve for x because uh, the unknown x uh, is on both sides of the equation. But one thing I can do is that I can replace the x on the right hand side by the whole expression. So I can replace it by 1 plus ax. And if I multiply this out, I get this expression here, 1 plus a plus i squared x. And now I do the same again. I replace x by 1 plus ax, and I multiply out, I get this, and so on. So you see that it looks like if I do this an infinite number of times, I will get this infinite series of powers of A. So our conjecture is that the inverse of 1 minus A is equal to this infinite series of powers of A, at least for certain values of A. Now, let us look again at the uh, few examples. So if I take a is 0 0.1, I get 1 over 0 0.9, which we know is 1.1111. But I can write this as 1 plus 0 0.1 plus its square plus its third power and so on. So that was our first example and we see that this relation is indeed true. The same holds for 0 0.01. And now you see actually why this pattern repeats, because this uh, 0 0.01 that we add uh, at each iteration, that, that is powers of my number a. If a is 1 half, well, the left-hand side uh, of my relation is given by 1 over 1 minus a half, which is 1 over a half, which is 2. And on the right hand side, I get, you know, inverses of powers of 2. That is precisely the first example I gave. Now, what happens when a is equal to 1? Well, then I have a problem because I divide by 0, and that is, in principle, not permitted. While on the other and uh, the sum of powers of 1, that is just 1 plus 1 plus 1, and so on, that is infinite. So one could, in this case, in fact, argue that 1 over 0 should be infinity, but one also has to, always has to be a bit careful with signs and so on. So in that case, one could still argue that the relation is true. But how about a equals minus 1? Well, then the left-hand side is a half, and the right-hand side is the sum 1 plus minus 1 plus 1 plus minus 1, and so on. And here it is actually 
not easy to define the limit. So one, one can actually give meanings of limits of the sequence, but if I just, you know, add the n first uh, numbers in my sequence, it will not converge because it will always flip back and forth between 1 and 0. And if a equals 2, for instance, the left-hand side is equal to minus 1, while the right-hand side is equal to the sum of powers of 2, which is infinite. Now, so here the relation does, doesn't work at all. Now, one could, of course, define limits in a different way. So you may be aware of this, what is called uh, Ramanujan summation, where uh, you can argue that the sum of all positive integers is e actually equal to minus 1 over 12. Well, this relies on a similar argument where you compare, uh, you know, series and, uh, and fractions, and you could probably uh, construct a definition of limits and a, a way of doing calculus in which this relation is true, but that is not what we want to have here. So, here's a fair one. It says that my relation is true if and only if A is strictly between minus 1 and 1 for real numbers A. And that is actually not so hard to show. So let's look at the proof. So I take n to be an integer larger or equal 1. And I look at this expression here. So 1 minus a times the finite sum of powers of a from 1 to n. And I'm going to expand this product here. So what I get is 1 times this product that gives me uh, 1 times the sum, that gives me the sum here. And then I have minus a times the same sum. That gives me this term here. And now I just multiply out everything in, uh, in the second term. And then you see that we get a lot of cancellations. So the a's cancel, the a square cancel, and so on, up to a to the n. So in the end, I just keep 1 minus a to the power n plus 1. And therefore, if a is different from 1, I can divide my relation on both sides by 1 minus a. So I get that my finite sum of powers from 1 to n is equal to 1 minus a to the n plus 1 over 1 minus a. And now I just observe that as n goes to infinity, a to the n plus 1 goes to 0 if and only if a is strictly between minus 1 and 1. So this proves my theorem, and uh, that is called in mathematics the geometric series. So this was still a rather simple example, but now I want to look at something more complicated. So let me look at an equation of degree 2. So the equation ax squared minus x plus 1 equals 0, where a, again, is a real number. Now, this is, again, an equation that we know how to solve. So that, let me recall the general theory on these uh, equations of degree 2. So if I have an equation of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, and a is different from 0, uh, what I have to do is to compute the so-called discriminant. Delta is b squared minus 4ac. And I have three cases. When the discriminant is strictly positive, my equation admits two real solutions with the expressions I give here. If delta is 0, there's one unique solution given, given by minus b over 2a. And if delta is negative, there are no real solutions. Now, you may know that one can actually define complex solutions, but we will not need this here. Now, in our case, b is equal to minus 1 and c is equal to 1. And therefore, the discriminant is 
1 minus 4a. And therefore, we know that if a is strictly less than a quarter, then I have two real solutions given by this expression here. So 1 plus or minus square root 1 minus 4a divided by 2a. Now assume that we don't want to compute uh, square roots and we look for a quick way to find approximate expressions of the solution for a small. So here's something different we can do and which looks similar to what I did before for the linear equation. So I can rewrite my equation like this. So x should be equal to 1 plus a times x squared. And the argument here is that I'm interested in small values of a. So, so a times x squared uh, might be small as well. So maybe that, that will give me good approximation. And as before, I'm going to replace x on the right hand side by the whole expression. So I know that x has to be equal to this, 1 plus a times the square of 1 plus a x squared. Now let me expand the square. I get this. And then let me multiply out. And I get this expression here. Now again, there are powers of x on the right hand side. So what I'm going to do in the next step is again replace every x by 1 plus a times x squared, like this. And then I have to expand again. And that gives me quite a lot of terms, and I'm not going to write all of them. What I'm going to do is uh, order them by powers, by increasing powers of a. So if you do the computation here, you find all terms that have powers of a up to 4. But you see uh, there are more terms, so the largest term, I, large, largest power of a I get will be a to the 3 times a to the 4, so a to the 7. So there are terms of order a to the 5, 6, and 7 I've not written here. And then I keep doing this. So again, I replace every x by 1 plus a times x squared. And here I've skipped a few steps, so that is a doable computation, but it's a bit cumbersome to do. And again, I've only kept powers of a up to 4. So I get this expression here. So the question now is, OK, first of all, we had two solutions for a smaller than a quarter. You can actually check that this solution would correspond to the solution with a negative sign uh, because as a goes to 0, it has to converge to 1. And even though I divide by a, if I do a Taylor expansion of the square root, I will find that as a goes to 0, this solution with a minus sign uh, converges to 1, while the other one will actually go to infinity. But my main question is, is there a simpler way to determine the coefficients here of the powers of a? So these coefficients are 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, and so on. And if I had kept more terms in my expansion, I could have uh, computed the next, so the coefficient of a to the 5, a to the 6, and so on. But it, was, it doesn't look so simple to generalize this to any power of a. Now, what is the sequence? Well, it's definitely not the Fibonacci sequence. So one thing you can do is there's a website called the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, OEIS. I'll come back to it later on. And you can give it this, these numbers and it will propose uh, known sequences of numbers that start with uh, 1, 1, 2, 5, 14. But 
Okay, let's not do that just yet. What I want to do now is use a graphical representation for uh, my equation. So again, I want to solve this equation. x is 1 plus a times x squared. Now I'm going to represent x by this symbol, symbol here, which is supposed to be a leaf. And then I have to decide how to represent x squared. So I will represent it by two leaves which are joined by two branches, so I get a little tree like this. And now I have to figure out how to represent graphically the operation of replacing x by 1 plus ax squared. So what does it mean that I replace a leaf by a sum of two terms? Well, as we've seen when we wrote this uh, as algebraic identities, is that each x, it, each leaf, can be replaced either by, by 1 or by ax squared. And therefore I get four possible terms. So I can replace two leaves by 1, and then I say that I just drop the leaves, so I get a tree without leaves. Or I replace the left hand leaf by the whole tree and the right hand leaf by one. And I have an extra uh, factor of a, so the a here becomes a squared. Or I can do it the other way around. I can replace the left leaf by one and the right leaf by the whole tree. Or Last possibility, I can replace both leaves by the whole tree. And then I get an a to the 3 here. So that is my inductive step. Now I can do this again. So at the next step, I will replace all leaves either by 1 or by the tree and increase the power of a. So here I first put all the terms where I have replaced the leaves by 1. So I've dropped the leaves. And then I have represented some of the terms where I have done something more complicated. So replace one leaf or two leaves by a tree. Actually just one leaf here. And here, so I go all to up to powers a to the 3, but I could go on like that. And at the next step, again, I replace every leaf either by 1 or by the tree, which for the terms I have shown here uh, just amounts to dropping all the leaves. So what have we gained with this graphical representation? Well, what we have gained is that we can make the observation that the coefficient of a to the n is actually equal to the number of binary trees with n plus 1 leaves. So a binary tree is uh, something like, like this, where you have a root, then you have uh, either no branch or two branches going out, and then you do things like that, where okay, you can have at each level either you have a, you stop the tree or you you add another two branches and it takes a little bit of thinking that to uh, to be sure that this is correct that i actually get all the trees uh, with a certain number of leaves at every step but it is indeed true so how many uh, trees, binary trees with n plus 1 leaves are there? Well, this is, uh, this is a known fact. Uh, and if I denote this number by Cn, this is called uh, the Catalan or Catalan number. So Catalan was Belgian. Uh, and here I've drawn the first uh, few cases. So I have one tree with no 
uh, with one leaf, so this is this tree where that has no branch at all. I have exactly one binary tree with two leaves, which is this one here, but then I have two binary trees with three leaves, and I, I have five binary trees with uh, four leaves, and I didn't draw it, but you can check that there are exactly 14 binary trees uh, with five leaves. So the question is, how many trees, binary trees with six leaves are there, and so on. Now here uh, is the, the beginning of the sequence of these catalog numbers that you find on, on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. So you see it starts indeed with 1, 1, 2, 5, 14, then the next number is 42, and then the numbers keep growing and they grow quite fast actually. So the question is how do we find uh, the following numbers? And there are several ways of doing it, and we'll look at a couple of them. So one way of doing it is to using a recurrence relation. So the observation is that if I fix a certain number of leaves, n plus 2, and I have a binary tree with n plus 2 leaves, well, my tree always starts with uh, two branches from the, from the root, and then this is a symbol here to say that I add one tree to the left branch and one tree to the right branch. And these trees can have any number of leaves as long as the total number of leaves is n plus 2. So let me say that the left-hand tree has k plus 1 leaves and the right-hand tr tree has n minus k plus 1 leaves. So indeed the sum is n plus 2. And k can be any integer between 0 and n. So what this tells me is that Cn plus 1, so the number of binary trees with n plus 2 leaves, is given to this sum here. So the first term means that I put only the, the trivial tree with one leaf at the left and any tree with n leaves, n plus 1 leaves at the right. The second term means that I can put a tree with two leaves at the left and a tree with n leaves at the right, and so on. So I get this relation here. And, well, we can check, for instance. So we call that C0 and C1 were equal to 1, and C2 was equal to 2. So C3 here will be equal to, uh, so what is it? 1 times 2 plus 1 times 1 plus 2 times 1, and that gives me 5. And C4 will be a uh, sum of four terms, and I get 5 plus 2 plus 2 plus 5, which is 40. And you can now use the same inductive relation to get C5 and so on. So this is already quite nice, but still, uh, if I want to compute C index 100, with this method I would have to compute all the previous numbers, so it can take some time. Now, here's another nice observation. So, this of course is Pascal's triangle. So it is defined by putting ones on the sides of the triangle and each number is the sum of uh, the two numbers uh, above, uh, so to the left and right. So for instance, six is equal to three plus three or 15 is equal to 5 plus 10. So these numbers are called binomial coefficients because they appear when you expand a plus b to some power. Now let's observe the following thing. Let me just look at the middle column of numbers here. And then I am going to divide the first number by 1, the second by 2, the third by 3, and so on. So 1 over 1 is 1. One, 2 over 2 is 1, 6 over 3 is 2, 20 over 4 is 5, and 70 over 5 is 40. So 
I get the sequence 112514 and it looks like I get indeed these Catalan numbers. And that is indeed true. So here's a theorem. It tells me that the nth Catalan number is given by the binomial coefficient 2n choose n. So these are on the middle column of Pascal's triangle divided by n plus 1. And if I use the definition of binomial coefficients in terms of factorials, I can write this in the following way. So let me uh, give you a partial proof of this relation. So one thing people do in combinatorics, which is the branch of mathematics where you count objects, is to uh, construct one-to-one -one maps between different classes of objects. And the aim is to get another type of object which is easier to count. So here I am first going to associate with every binary tree a word composed of letters A or B. And the rule is that I will put empty words on the leaves of my binary tree and then I, I will go down all the way to the root and every time two branches meet, the rule is that the word will be A followed by the word on the left branch and then B followed by the word on the right branch. So at this vertex here, since uh, I have empty words on the two leaves, my word will be AB. On the next branch here, I will have A followed by AB, followed by B, followed by the empty word. And at the next stage, I will have A followed by this word AABB, and then B followed by the empty word. And I can do this for every binary tree. So here I do it for all five trees that have four leaves. So in this case, I get the word AABABB, and so on and so forth. So I've gotten here five different words. So uh, what can I observe about these words? Well, they are all made of letters A and B. They all have the same numbers of A's and B's. But there's, there's more. For instance, there's no word starting with B. So there's an additional uh, constraint here on the words. Now, let us do one further transformation where I associate with each word a broken line in the following way. So whenever I have a letter A, I replace it by a, by a slash, so by a path going to the right and up. And every B I replace by a backslash, so a path going down a step. So, for instance, the word AAABBB will be represented by a path going up three steps and then down three steps. Here, AABABB goes up two steps, down one step, up one step, and down two steps, and so on. So, one thing you can observe here is that, first of all, every path is uh, starting at a certain level which is my x-axis, and coming back to the same level, that is simply because I have uh, the same number of letters A and B. But another observation is that uh, actually the, the path I get never go below the x-axis. So the claim here is that for every uh, binary tree, I will get a word, and for every word, I will get a path. And these paths are excursions of two end steps that start on the x-axis, then they go up and down a certain number of times, they 
reach the x-axis again at the end and they never go below the x-axis. So these are called Dieck paths after the name of a German mathematician. Now I will not prove it in detail but you can check that this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So to every tree there corresponds exactly one Dieck path and to every Dieck path corresponds a certain tree. So if you want to figure out a proof, maybe a few hints. So one hint is that actually all intermediate worlds I get here in, in my trees, they all have this property. So in, to prove that every uh, binary tree will give a dig path, you can do some kind of proof of induction. And to prove it the other way around, to say that for each Dieck path you will get a binary tree, you have to figure out a way to go back from a path to trees. And here an idea is to, to say that something special happens when you know, there are certain paths like here which I can split up in shorter Dieck path. And so you can figure out a way to reconstruct the tree from that. Now, uh, we still have to figure out why a Cn is equal to 2n choose n divided by n plus 1. So 2n choose n, that is uh, the number of words with 2n letters, half of which are a's and half of which are b's. So I have only to understand why I divide by n plus 1. So the, the idea is that the, the Dieck path, those that stay above the x-axis, are given by all the paths divided by n plus 1. And here's a, a clever trick of doing that. So let me uh, look at general path that can go below the axis. And to such a path, I'm going to associate uh, a defect, which is the number of segments like, like this, which go up and are below the axis. So here, this uh, path on the left has a defect of two. And the one on the right has a defect of one. And here I have an operation which takes a path of defect 2 and transforms it into a path of defect 1. So how does it go? Well, I follow the path until I go below the x-axis and then I keep following it until it reaches the x-axis again. So I have here colored in red the, the last segment before I reach the x-axis again. And on the right hand side I have swapped the part, the green part, which is after the red path and the blue part. And you can figure out that with this transformation the path with defect n plus 1 will give a path with defect n. And now here I have drawn all possible paths of length, uh, so the length is 6 here, and so the number will be uh, 6 choose 3, which is 20. So I've do, written, uh, shown all 20 paths here. And you see that in the first column I have a defect of 3, so this one has a defect of 3, this one as well, and so on. And then here I have a defect of 2, and here I have a defect of 1, and in the last column I have a defect of 0. So these are Dieck path. And <coughs> what happens here is that because of this construction, I see that to every uh, path of defect 3, I can associate a path of defect 2, and then defect 1, and then the Dieck path. And 
This means that I actually have what is called equivalence classes. So I have a first class down here. So I have a, all these paths are transformed one into the other by my transformation. I have a second one here, a third one here, and so on and so forth. And just because of the fact that I have an equivalence relation and that uh, my defects range from uh, 0 to 3, actually all these uh, five classes here have exactly the same number of uh, paths, which is 4. And so I can find the number of classes, which is 20 divided by by 4, so 20 divided by 4, which is 5. In 5 that is here, so I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 classes, and this gives me, uh, in particular, my 5 deep path. So in this way, I've shown it here on a specific example, but it's true in general, with this construction I have indeed proved my relation here for the Catalan numbers. So there is also a reverse argument. So what I've shown so far is that if I start with my equation of degree 2 and I solve it by this iterative procedure, I get uh, a series expansion into powers of A and the coefficients are Catalan numbers. Uh, now, we can also see, uh, we can start from this expansion, so let me call f of a this series here. So, the Cutler number c0 plus c1 times a plus c2 times a squared and so on. This is called the generating series of the Cutler numbers. Now, let me compute the square of this series. And so what I do for that is I, I take the series times itself and I multiply things out and I collect powers of A. So, for instance, the term of order 1 will be C0 times C0. The term of order A, well, that will be C0 times C1A plus C1A times C0 and so on. And what I get is terms like this, so there will be more and more terms in each coefficient as the power of A grows. However, remember my uh, recursive construction of the Catalan numbers. Actually, C0 squared, that's C1. This C0, C1 plus C1, C0 is C2. This guy here is C3. And this guy here is C4, and so on. Now this is almost my function f of a. Actually, it is f of a minus c0 divided by a. And since c0 is 1, my equation here, f of a squared is f of a minus c0 over a, is exactly the same as a f square minus f plus 1 equals 0, which is actually the equation satisfied by x. So this type of information on the generating series and the explicit expression of the series, if I, I can get it, is useful to give uh, information on how the Cn behave for n large. So let me wrap up. So why is this useful and what have we done? So I've shown that a certain type of equation, so this equation of degree 2, can be solved exactly, but it can also be solved by uh, a graphical construction with some iterations. And this graphical construction showed that actually the coefficients of powers of A 
are certain numbers which count certain objects, so in this case it is binary trees, and then we can actually find an explicit formula for the number of trees. So one reason why this is useful is that this can often give good approximations for the solution when A is small. And remember the explicit expression involved a square root and computing a square root can take time, while just you know, computing a polynomial, so I just have to add and multiply things, that is much faster. A second uh, point why this is useful is that this actually applies to many different equations. So for instance, here I have an equation of degree 5 instead of 2. And for degree, degree 5, there's no nice general theory like for degree 2. However, I can still do the same thing as before, so I can write this equation as x is equal to 1 plus a times x to the 5. And I can do this game of uh, substituting the x on the right hand side by 1 plus a x to the 5. And what I find by doing that is actually that the coefficient of a to some power will be the number of trees, but now it's not binary trees, now it's trees of degree 5. So like this one, or I can have a tree like this, and so on. And there's again a sequence counting this number of trees, so it's known as Pfaffus Catalan sequence, uh, it's also a type of Wayne numbers, and uh, you find this, uh, this sequence here. But I can do it for any other integer than 5 or 2. So it gives me a general formula for equations of the form a x to the n minus x plus 1 equals 0, but I can also adapt this to more complicated equations. And the last, uh, one last thing is that we've seen that it gives links between different types of mathematical objects and also fields of mathematics. So these Catalan numbers, they count binary trees, they count deep words and deep paths, but they also count other things like uh, triangulations of polygons, for instance. And this is often useful in mathematics to find relations like that. And last but not least, uh, Feynman diagrams are actually kind of similar in spirit as this construction where I constructed trees by uh, doing some kind of substitution argument. So this will be the matter of my next talk on the subject. So that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.